talk. Today we have Laura Formentini. Laura is an author, photographer, and philanthropist. Welcome to the podcast, Laura. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So the first question I want to start with is when did you realize that you were a giver? Well, I've been a giver my whole life. And, um, and I realized it when I was probably in middle school, maybe even the beginning of high school. Because a lot of my friends would just, t- you know, just hang out and go to, you know, go out with their friends. And I would be drawn to maybe signing up for, I would take out mentally challenged kids in the afternoon and sign up for maybe an afternoon with them and take them, uh, you know, sign up for an association and, and take them out and maybe feed them at the cafeteria and take them to the park with other kids and and people, people my age were thinking, what is wrong with you? But I, it was really something that came from the heart. And I've always been that way. Interesting, because I was very, um, I grew up in a family that was pretty much the opposite, and uh, very materialistic. And I never really cared about the material stuff. I was always more into giving and I was very sensitive, overly sensitive. Uh, I think because I've suffered a lot because of that until I realized that um, I had to create my boundaries because I would give to everybody. You know, I was almost almost like a um, mother Teresa, everybody who's in pain or, or needed advice. I was always there dropping everything I was doing. And um, I was pretty much, Yeah, I was going to ask you, how did you protect yourself from being, you know, taken advantage of? Because I always see a saying about, you know, givers give, but um, takers, you know, take and never give back or pour into you. So did you ever experience something where you did get taken advantage of and you learned to be more cautious about how you gave and what you gave? Or have you just felt like I'm just going to give and I don't care, you know, you know, what, what I'm receiving? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would just give and give and give without really receiving much back, or sometimes I wouldn't receive anything back. But it's not that I would give because I wanted something back. Mm -hmm. It was just something that I was doing naturally, and I still do naturally. Um, Yes, I've been taken advantage of many times. And I've suffered a lot because of that. And, uh, and unfortunately, I'm an empath, so I'm very compassionate, but I have a lot of empathy. And so unfortunately, empaths um, um, attract narcissists and takers. And so uh, we just don't realize it because until we're actually um, feeling sick or being, you know, we're abandoned and we don't really realize it because we think that everybody's like we, like us, uh, you know, we think that as givers we think that everybody else in the world is a giver but it's not that's not the case so um I have I had to that there came up came a point where I had to establish my boundaries and say no this is not right this is not good you know it's not it's not good for you to treat me this way because I'm giving you this I don't want anything back I'm giving you whatever I'm giving you because it feels good, but it doesn't feel good when you're uh, disrespecting me. And so I've learned that um, I had to create my boundaries. And, I've, you know, I've been it's it's a it's something that as givers, we have to constantly check in with ourselves and say, mm, how is this person treating me? Am I being disrespected? Am I being taken advantage of? How do I feel? I have to keep recentering. And if it feels good then it means it's a relationship that is worth keeping. Uh, If it doesn't feel good, they might 
take advantage of you maybe one time or it, it might happen once. And then if you catch them, you say, you know, then you're, you're able to maybe save the relationship. But if it happens again, that means that it's a habit and I'm not going to re-engage. So right. that's, okay. yeah. Okay. Well, at least that's, you know, something that you're, you're doing, you know, because that's definitely, that can be a problem. So you said that you grew up in a family where this wasn't the norm. So do you think that you were just born this way or did you see someone else doing this and it inspired you to, to be, um, you know, someone who's a giver? I think I was just born this way and I was always drawn to, you know, I would, for instance, save the you know, the kitten in the street, or I would just uh, be uh, there for the, the the kid in school who would be, you know, wouldn't wasn't necessarily that popular, or, you know, I would just always try to go up to them and talk to, you know, kind of like the, the, those who are maybe not, not popular and um, feeling sad and lonely. I was like, Oh, you know, I, I just feel, feel people's emotions and uh, the emotions of animals. And so I've always been that way. Um, wow. So I was just doing whatever was feeling right for my, for me, for my soul. <laughs> and, yeah. and it's been like that ever since I was really young. Yeah. Oh, wow. So now shifting gears a little bit, when did you discover photography? And when did you realize that you could make a living doing it? Photography has been something that um, has always been very, very interesting to me because um, I've realized that I have this gift of being able to see things from uh, from different angles that, for instance, the angles that a lot of people's people would not necessarily see. So, um, you know, I'm able to capture something. It's just like the gift of the photographer you know, able to capture something that maybe the, the average person wouldn't able, wouldn't be able to catch. Um, And so it's been passion my whole life. And then I discovered nonprofit photography, which really was uh, where I was really able to combine this gift of being able to see uh, maybe different, I'm very creative. And so to really see uh, from a different angle, from a different different perspective, and then to combine it with um, helping others. So um, basically, nonprofit photography is all about uh, being able to uh, capture an image, um, uh, say, when you're working with an organization, um, and... And the image is representing, is capturing the reality in which a person or a community is living. And then those, those photos, they can be used uh, on their website or to promote a cause or uh, to fundraise. So it's, um, so it's been, it's been really rewarding. It's something that, wow, it's (laughs) how am I going to combine my gift, my natural gift with um, with something that, you know, can also help others. So it's been wonderful. It's taken me all over the world. Um, I've worked in Africa, I've worked in uh, Central America and Europe and, and it's been amazing. So what is your favorite image to shoot? I would say what I like to shoot is uh, capturing, I love to capture um, how, well, number one, how people live, you know, in their day to, day-to-day life. But also, I love to capture how people who have come out of the most strenuous circumstances have made it, have done it, have created something beautiful out of these difficult circumstances. So, for instance, shooting the founder of an orphanage, okay? Um, And I worked with um, a children's home in Kenya three years ago, and I was able to catch the founder in working with her 130 children that she 
uh, adopted from the slums. And she herself didn't have much money at all. But she had all the stamina, this, um, this amazing, towering love for these kids. And she kept going. Even she, she knew that she didn't necessarily have all the resources to keep going every day. But she had this big smile on all the time. And she infused this amazing love and vibrancy into anybody who would come in contact with her, into contact with her. And that was really amazing. So images, though, what are your favorite images to capture? Do you like capturing things? Do you like capturing people? Well, I would say that the favorite images that I like to capture are the images of people in their everyday situations. But I also love to capture animals because um, I've always had this passion for working with animals as well. So um, yeah, it's, um, I would say mainly, yeah, mainly people, people in their own everyday circumstances, everyday lives. Do you like them to be candid or is it like, do you like posed or? No, I, uh, you know, I would go, I can go for hours trying, and, you know, and, and shoot so many different photos. And, uh, and I, I just, um, I'm a lot of times I'm just there in a the corner and I'm just uh, shooting until I find the perfect moment, the perfect lighting and the perfect, uh, the, you know, the, the, the perfect moment. And so, no, I never asked to pose. It's always very, um, what I, what I love is to capture the moment, uh, the real the reality, the real moment. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So what is the most challenging aspect of a career in photography? Well, um, as far as nonprofit photography, um, goes, the most challenging aspect is that you're constantly on the go and, um, it's, um, you know, sometimes you'll be shooting in, uh, in a country for, you know, you're based in this country for, um, for a couple of months, and then you'll have to switch to a different country. And then, um, it's, um, uh, there's, um, you, you kind of live the, the life of a nomad. And that's the life that I've been living for a long time. But um, it's also something that I chose to do because I really love exploring and meeting people and um, savoring the different cultures and the different languages. Um, And so that could be a challenge, but um, you just have to be, you know, ready to experience the new, uh, the novelty. So who pays for the travel when you're a nonprofit photographer? Like, is it an organization? Do you have to pay for your own travel? Is it a combination? It's, of- yeah, it's a combination of both. It depends on the organization. I have just become a member of um, Photographers Without Borders. And with them, with them um, I'll be going on assignments with the UN. And so that's going to be also a combination of expenses. Um, But, you know, sometimes I've also paid myself and I've also volunteered to go and work with uh, specific communities where, you know, the I would just donate the um, the photos that I've taken to the um, the to the communities or, or so that they can promote for instance, their own causes, or uh, I also donated my, my photos to certain organizations. And so it's really a combination. Okay. So when you're traveling and you decide to, that you want to give to, you know, some locals in whatever country that you're in, how do you go about organizing that? Well, I have, my network is uh, of I know many people around the world and um, I have friends in many different countries. And uh, uh, for instance, I have friends in Kenya, I have friends in Malawi and um, 
because I've taken many, many trips uh, just on my own, just for fun in the past. And so I've made friends in specific areas where um, a lot of work is needed as far as, far as you know, a lot of diff- you know fundraising or photography. And so um, a lot of times I just contact my, my people, my friends, and they'll organize it for me. One of them was, for instance, the orphanage I worked with. Uh, three years ago in 20, 2018, they contacted the founder as well as the um, administrator and they asked, hey, do you want her to come in and take photos and or fundraise for you? And uh, they said yes. And so so basically, I just reached out to my network mm. and, um, and they'll organize it for me. Yeah. So do you are you ever um, afraid of being like hurt or kidnapped or anything crazy like that when you go into different villages and different countries all over the world? I always try to organize my my trips in a way where I go with a group. So I'll, I'll call up a friend and I'll, I always make sure that I'm going with the friend and the locals that, yeah. you know, uh, I always try to go with a group. So I've never been uh, in specific areas of the world by myself doing this. Right. Because, you know, you got to be careful. You got to be very careful, especially in, uh, yes, in yeah, specific absolutely. areas. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So if someone wanted to go, um, to like travel to a country and they felt like because you know like sometimes you see people say oh I went to this country and I gave back to the local village I gave the kids this or that that's definitely something that has to be organized through an organization who knows like who needs what and what needs to happen like you should not just be popping up trying to go donate right okay all right no, exactly. Because um, there's also something called ethical photography, which, you know, I had to become certified in. And so you cannot, uh, you know, according to ethical photography, you cannot do certain things that, um, you know, is going to be detrimental to the community, you cannot uh, impose your culture, your own culture on um, onto their community or onto their culture. So um, my, uh, my suggestion is always to try to go with an organization that is established, like a nonprofit photography workshop, for instance. There's, so, there's lots out there. If you want to give back, it's a great uh, way to, to travel and to give back is to sign up with a nonprofit photography workshop. I did one um, about, I think it was a year and a half ago, I went to Puerto Rico and it was fantastic. Uh, Last year I was supposed to go to Fiji, but it was canceled because it was 2020. So um, hopefully it'll happen this year. But my, um, my suggestion is to definitely try to stick with an organization who, um, who organizes everything for you. So it's safe for you and you follow the guidelines as well. Yeah. And I I mean, when I ask that question too, I mean like giving like things, items, like books, like if you wanted to donate books or like shoes or clothes or toiletries, like you should be going through an organization to organize that, right? I would say it's uh, definitely something that I would recommend. Yes. Okay. Because um, you don't want to be, you know, you want to be helpful. You don't want to, um, you don't want to cause any harm because, you know, a lot of tourists, you know, for instance, the one time I went to, I uh, took this really long trip to, um, uh, to Africa. I started in uh, South Africa and it ended in Tanzania. I was, we, it was an eight country tour. Okay, of the southern portion of Africa. And a lot of the people on the tour basically ended up giving money and candy to the kids who were begging in the streets. It's something that a lot of the nonprofit organizations, for instance, a nonprofit photography organization, would recommend you not do because you're implementing something that you don't want to 
happen. You know, want these kids to get used to receiving free money, uh, free gifts. And, you know, it's, it becomes easier for them to beg and, you know, and just rely on the tourists who come by. So mm. it's something that they recommend not doing. It's um, if, if you're able to do it through the organization, uh, you know, obviously, the, you know, you can maybe set up, uh, you know, a lot of organizations set up, um, you know, a, you know, you, you can donate, um, you know, certain things to the organization and then the organization will give to the communities uh, or for instance, not necessary to the kids, but to the schools or to the clinics or, you know, you can donate money straight, you know, you can donate money to the organization that will give to the clinics, the schools, but not directly to the kids because it. it will be, yeah. Not good for, you know, them in the not, future, like going forward. Not good. Yeah. Okay. So um, you are also an author. So tell us about the first book you wrote and what got you into um, writing? Is it something that you, you used to journal and you always loved writing? Or is it something that just came about as you were on your travels and wanted to, you know, share some information with people? Yeah, well, um, so I decided, you know, after traveling extensively, and after seeing, uh, after realizing that there are so many amazing people out there in the world who have come out of the most difficult circumstances and have created really amazing, um, amazing realities. Uh, I've decided to write about these stories of transformation, stories of inspiration. I realize, and I realized that if they were able to do something this amazing, uh, you know, considering their circumstances and how difficult their, their life had been, uh, we in our first world, quote unquote, can also do so much. We are all able to, to, to create, to do something amazing, to, to share our gifts with others and to be nice and be kind and give. And so that was really the inspiration. You know, I decided, I said, hmm, how about uh, collecting stories of inspiration? Um, my, ver- my very first book, and I just finished it, and it's going to be um, coming out um, on June 1st, is um, a book that I dedicated to my son. And, um, and my son passed away in 2019. Um, I decided to write this book because my son was a um, highly sensitive person, just like myself in HSP. And um, it was a very challenging, it was very challenging for him, uh, challenging for him to, to live in this world because he thought it was extremely harsh. And uh, he was an empath and was absorbing all the energies around him. And it was very difficult for him uh, to uh, move forward. And um, he, um, he is not here anymore. And um, I decided to dedicate this book to him, but also to all of the highly sensitive people out there, because there is something very special that we hold inside of us. It's called compassion. It's called empathy. And the reason why I decided to write this book, which is called 21 Olive Trees, is because I believe that the, need, the world needs more compassion. The world needs more kindness. And the world does need us, empaths and compassionate people, because it's our superpower. We believe that, you know, we are... Um, too shy, too sensitive. We can't do it. It's too much. It's too harsh. But once we once we realize that, it takes setting up our boundaries and learning how to say no to what is not right, to uh, what doesn't feel good to us. Learning to set up those boundaries. Once we do, then we can really, really 
uh, empower ourselves and use those superpowers. The superpowers, the compassion, the empathy can really bring us to the edge of the world. We can really light up and follow the spark, the creativity, creativity that we have. Um, so 21 Olive Trees is a book that I wrote dedicated. It's dedicated to my son, to all the HSPs out there. He was 21 years old when he passed and um, he took his life. And I decided to uh, call it 21 Olive Trees because the olive tree is a symbol of longevity, of peace. And each, um, each olive tree is a symbol of uh, basically holds a piece of wisdom. So it's a, it's a book of fables, 21 fables. And each, each fable holds a piece of wisdom. And um, so it's a book that is, is uh, meant to empower the HSPs and say, listen, follow the wisdom that you have inside. You don't have to look outside. Just follow that wisdom that you have inside. And once you always follow that, then you are able to really, really, really create uh, something amazing um, in this world and share your gifts with the rest of the world. Wow. Well, I'm really sorry for your loss. I know that that really never helps anything when people say it, but I really am because I'm a mom as well. And I know that that has to be like the worst thing ever. But I love that you wrote this book and you're dedicating it to your son and um, I'm sure that he's happy and proud about that, too. So I never knew that there was a distinction for like um, highly sensitive people. Like, so is this really like a distinction that's being used now? Well, highly sensitive people are uh, basically, I would say they are the, the people who absorb all the energies around them. Okay, and if you're not careful, you're absorbing the good, you're absorbing the bad. And so, um, and it can affect you tremendously if you don't have boundaries up, if you don't have that, that, uh, you know, imaginary line, uh, boundary line between you and another, or you and a situation or you and a place, if you don't have that up, it, it affects you tremendously for a long time. And it can affect your work, your relationships, your relationship with yourself. And so um, it's, it, it's incredibly challenging if you don't know how to say no, because you're, again, you, you know, a highly sensitive person is the person who thinks that everybody's a giver, that everybody is just as sensitive and so you're, you're going out into the world thinking that the world is just like you, but that is not the case. And highly sensitive people, so we, it's, we have about 8 billion people in the world. Highly sen- the, the highly sensitive people of this world are about 10, 15% of the population. So you're talking about probably about 1.5 billion people. It's a lot of people. And unfortunately, what happens is being a highly sensitive person, you think that, um, that, you know, everybody's like you, but then when you realize that, you know, unfortunately there are a lot of takers out there, more takers than givers, then um, it it affects you tremendously. And so um, it's very important to, to realize that you cannot move forward in the world unless you set up your boundaries. Once you do, then you're almost basically unstoppable because there are so many things that you can do with your gifts. Yeah. Wow. That's so fascinating. I never knew that. All right. So how can others who want to give back, you know, find some way, like, can you give us any advice or any um, organizations that we can, you know, look into giving back through? (laughs) Yeah, one of the um, uh, one of my suggestions is um, I know that, uh, for instance, a lot of people aren't able to necessarily travel 
well, especially this period has been very challenging, but a lot of people are not able to travel because of work or because of family or, you know, various commitments. One of the, um, one of the ways uh, that I find fascinating and very rewarding as far as giving back is um, sponsoring a child. Uh, sponsoring a child is something that is incredibly rewarding. And I, um, I've been sponsoring uh, more than 40 children uh, over the past, I would say, 17 years. And um, it's an incredibly rewarding experience because it can improve your life and it gives this priceless gift of hope to not only the child uh, whom you are sponsoring, but also to the community in which the child lives. It's an amazing experience because, um, you know, you, you get to pick a country in which a child lives. You get to pick the, you know, either boy or girl, the age group. And then you create an amazing, you forge an amazing relationship that can last not only 18 years, because, you know, a lot of organizations will say, okay, you can sponsor the child until uh, he or she is 18 years of age. Um, And then it's up to you to keep sponsoring another child if you want to. But you can forge a relationship that can be really like a lifelong experience because after, after the sponsorship quote unquote uh, commitment ends, you can continue uh, our relationship with them through letters or, you know, uh, you can continue having a relationship with them through the community. So I think that's something that could potentially be very beneficial for a person especially who is not able to travel but also for for a person who is able to travel it's just an amazing experience also because you can uh, request to take a trip to the country in which the child lives and um, uh, with the help with the aid of the the aid of the organization you can go and visit the child, visit the community, and really see how they live and how your money is being spent. Oh, wow. So what is the name of that organization? Can you share that? Sure. Um, yeah, I've been sponsoring over 40 children through Plan International okay. uh, USA, and they're based out of Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. And um, they currently have... I believe about 50,000 sponsors for children all over the world together with plan. I'm also writing a book this year um, on the positive impact that sponsorship has had on the lives of adults who were sponsored when they were children. So with the help of the plan international offices in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, I'm going to begin interviewing the adults and their amazing stories, um, basically uh, speaking about how the impact of their sponsorship has rippled through um, their lives and their communities. Wow, that is great. I love that because a lot of times when people give, um, whether it be to an organization or to, you know, something like this, where you're actually, it's a reoccurring, um, you know, expense or whatever. Um, You never really know where your money is going, right? You do it with the intention that I'm giving, I want this to go to wherever it's supposed to go to, but you, you, a lot of times you don't know. So I love that you are doing this book that tells the story of these people who actually been directly impacted by other people giving to them over the course of their lives and how it changed, you know, their lives. I think that's fabulous. Yeah, I think that it's true. A lot of people are really afraid of scams and how, how is my 
money being spent if I you know because a lot of people out there really want to make a difference it's just difficult in this world to be able to trust and so um, one of the things that I recommend is obviously I've, I've been uh, working with Plan International, Plan International USA for a long time, but um, and I will continue working with them. But one of the suggestions, um, if you want to, uh, if you want to donate or join a cause or join an organization, is to go on uh, something called Charity Navigator, which is the world's largest. Uh, uh, independent nonprofit evaluator. So basically, it empowers a donor uh, with uh, free access to data and tools. And um, in, in you know what happened to me was I had two boys, and I really wanted to have a girl. Okay, and uh, but I didn't want to have any more children. So I also knew that I couldn't afford to adopt. So I started looking on the internet for a way I could help girls in 2004. And the very first option that I discovered was sponsorship. I went on Charity Navigator and it was amazing. Uh, so I, during my research, I discovered Plan International, which you know formerly was called Plan USA, which was an organization for the advancement of children's rights and equality for girls. And so my very first sponsored child was a two-year-old girl from Zimbabwe. And um, I can't describe how happy I was, the joy I had knowing I already had a girl in my life. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I also sponsor many boys, but my heart goes out to the girls because they face violence and oppression mm. more than boys around the world and often find themselves in really overwhelming um, circumstances that, that uh, block their paths for growth and education. And so, um, and I, you know, I believe we must tear down the barriers and, and that face girls, um, that girls face in this world. Um, and so, you know, whether you're looking for some companionship, want to further, you know, the, uh, the advancement of children's rights, I think that the gift of giving hope is priceless. The gift of giving hope to others through sponsorship is really priceless. And um, I cannot recommend it enough. And it's beautiful because, as you know, again, I've been sponsoring so many children over the years. It's beautiful because you'll receive letters and uh, updates from the community. And so you're constantly in contact with them. You know what's going on. You know, some, some countries are more a bit uh, harder to reach than others because maybe there are, you know, maybe that particular country is going through a, um, a war or so they might be a little bit slower to get back to you. But. Overall, you know, you do get updates uh, numerous times throughout the year. And you are also able to send them gifts, not directly, but through the organization. So, you know, you could send them uh, not gifts of, of money, but gifts of, for instance, you could send them crayons or you could send them a, a soccer ball or, um, you know, and generally, you know, a lot of organizations will offer a list of what you can pick and choose to send the children. And so it's really, um, it's really fun. And then you can also send, send them letters, obviously in generally in the, it, now it's, it's done uh, through emails because that's the, the fastest way, but it's nice to be able to communicate and, you know, you know, say you send them an email you won't necessarily receive a response right away. It might take, I don't know, um, might take three months to get a response, but you will get a response. And if, if you're not getting a response, maybe within a few months, then your organization will get back to you and say, this is what's going on in the country. It's, it's a little bit slower because of what's going on. And, 
So, but it's nice. It's beautiful that you're not only communicating with them, but you receive updates on, on their health, on how the community is doing, or you're always updated basically. And um, it's not just sponsoring a child that gives hope. It's also sponsoring the community because your money goes to the child, but also to the communities. You're helping their families uh, to become self-sufficient with the money that you're sending. So basically the, the contributions are ensured to have a lasting presence in, in communities as long as required and also help to secure large grants from institutional donors to multiply your contribution. And this allows relief organizations to reach many more children, families, communities. Another beautiful thing about sponsoring is that obviously besides forging this amazing relationship with a child in need and the community in which the child lives, you have the possibility to one day meet with your sponsored child because many organizations coordinate trips to the, for sponsors to meet their children. And until that happy day when we can travel safely again, right? <laughs> you know, you can virtually travel to your sponsored child's country, obviously through letters and so on, but you really get to virtually travel and learn how they live and, and, um, um, and, you know, what, you know, for instance, what they eat, uh, how they, you know, how they get their water and, you know, um, it's, you know, how they warm up their home, what their home is made of. So you really learn, even if you can't necessarily travel, you, you're virtually traveling to their country and it's a way of really exploring the world. It's a different way of exploring the world by not leaving the house and you're doing something really amazing. Absolutely. All right. So Laura, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing a little bit of your journey with us and teaching us about other ways to give. Can you please share your contact information with us, um, how we can connect with you, um, where we can find out more information about the um, sponsorship program you just told us about and where we will be able to purchase your book. Sure. Um, my website is um, lauraformentini.com. That's L-A-U-R-A-F-O-R-M-E-N-T-I-N-I.com. My, uh, the organization I am writing the book with is planusa.org. And my book will be available on Amazon as of June 1st. And the title is 21 Olive Trees. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Keisha. Thanks a lot.